This is going to be kind of a jam session. We're not quite sure where we are from point to point, but stay with us. We hope you'll enjoy it. 1966 was a wonderful year. It was the summer of love and the hippies, and it was also the middle of the Vietnam War. Uh, first heart, heart plant. Oh, there was a Super Bowl, Green Bay. It wasn't really called Super Bowl, but it was 66. Green Bay beat Kansas City Chiefs 35 to 10. A fellow by the name of Lark Starr, I don't know if you remember him or not. <laughs> well, anyway, if you read the announcements about us being here tonight, you may have thought the whole band was going to be here. Well, none of us would have had room to be here. So what we've done is our happy wanderers, Freudica, Freudica, Wanderer, Servut, okay. Okay, I'm going to, what we're going to do tonight, we're going to have five speakers, and each of them is going to tell a little bit about the history of the band, and in between, you get music, okay? All right. And this is uh, Phil Avenshein. Phil is one of three of the charter members. Phil has been playing in this band for 52 years. Probably got another 50 years, and he means only 92, so. Phil? <laughs> Thanks, Jack. It's hard to follow. I'm cold like Jack. You know, yeah. I'll say a couple of words to try and cheer you up a little bit. My wife said that uh, I should speak slow and loud. And get the microphone closing my mouth. <laughs> anyway, it reminds me of Lester Mace, who was my first band uh, director. Favorite or not, that was 80 years ago this year. I was in seventh grade. And I, uh, uh, he, had a, he had a favorite say. He said that you may play good or you may play loud, but some of them, the people play good and loud. But with me, I'm just kind of going to try and just say a few words about our, the history of the band. It's great to be here. Since I, he told, uh, Jack told you I was the oldest, I'm the oldest member, uh, not only the oldest in the band, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember, but I'm also going to be 92 years old in June. Wow. And also, one of the, and the other two charter members are here. I should probably say hi to them. There's Doris Seymour, and right over here. And he, he, he later. The Nina Music parents organized a popular show called Ham and Eggs to raise money for a trip to Canada by the Nina High School Band. This was uh, May 3rd, 1964, at the Nina High School Auditorium. The last act of the show was a short concert by a group of Nina High School alumni, band alumni. The band was, <laughs> the band, the band, the band director was directed by Lester Schme uh Mays, who founded the Nina High School band in 1929, and he always, he always had a few stories. In fact, all of these band directors had stories about some of their history. I was just going to tell you one or two. One was about some of the memories uh, Mr. Mays told about the time that he, early in the eight, uh, 1930s, that he was at a concert of the Sousa Band in Sheboygan. And while he was there, Mr. Sousa introduced himself and uh, he asked Mr. Mace if he would like to direct the Sousa Band. And of course, that was quite an honor. I think that was the biggest thing in his life, that particular day. But anyway, he really enjoyed that. And then, then we had Mr. Schultz, who directed the Fifth Army Band in World War II in Vienna, Austria. And he always told about the commanding general. I don't know if any of you remember Mark Clark. He was a five-star general, and he had the army that came up through Italy in World War II. Anyway, uh, he 
as Al shows to talk to the trombone players, he said they were having a problem. He said he wasn't used to seeing that they were not synchronizing their slides. Some slides go too far, some slides go too far. We all know that trombones uh, have different <coughs> positions for their different notes, but he didn't know that. <laughs> but anyway, I assembled at Shattuck Auditorium in what was originally Nina High School. The Nina High School music parents said, we're putting on a bottle show called Ham and Eggs and to raise money, to raise money for a high school band trip to Canada. The last act on the program was an appearance of an alumni band. Thank you. 
<laughs> and with each pack of cigarettes, no, nobody smoked them. It was just a, a, a unit of currency. Well, we got we got sidetracked. In New York, the uh, Romanian uh, plane was uh, late, and uh, it was a, a Soviet-made uh, twin jet, mm -hmm. and uh, apparently they had to do some maintenance on it. So, long story short, we were delayed, and we didn't take off and, and arrive in Bucharest until about 15 hours late. Mm -hmm. We were scheduled to do a concert that night. But we got to town about an hour and a half before the concert was supposed to start. We didn't even go to our hotel. We, uh, we changed into our uniforms, which was a tie. <laughs> and uh, we were welcomed with flowers and pretty young girls that, that surrounded us. We loved that. Mm -hmm. um, we played the concert, did a nice job. And uh, it was very, very gratifying. We got good reception. It was in the the main concert hall or opera house in Bucharest. Bucharest is an old city. And uh, Romania, you kind of felt sorry for those folks. They had, they had nothing. Uh, we went, I went to a meat market one day, and there's meat market uh, shelves on three sides. You know how much meat was in there? One dog bone, that was it. Uh, very poor country, but they treated us gracefully. And uh, we were happy to um, enjoy them and to spread our friendship to that that, um, that, co that country. I understand they're doing a lot better now. We took a plane then to uh, Austria and arrived in uh, Salzburg. And Salzburg uh, uh, is the birthplace of Mozart. And we just happened to be there when the annual Mozart uh, uh, convocation was going on. So a lot of us attended concerts that, uh, that honored Mozart. We also uh, uh, enjoyed the, the mountain scenery. Uh, the film Sound of Music was, was filmed in Salzburg. Uh, to them, it, it's nothing. It's not their music. They've never heard it. So there's ads all over Salzburg for the Sound of Music tours, but you'll never see an Austrian making the tour. They have no idea what that is. And we, from there, we went down the river at Danube on a cruise. And uh, we uh, ended up in a small town called Spitz, S P I T Z. And they were having their apricot festival. So we, we got to know those people very well. They had a, they had a community band just like ours. And they played in the afternoon, we played in the evening. And when we cleared the stage, they brought out their dance band. And uh, we danced until midnight, had, mixing it up with the, uh, with the Austrian folks. It was, it was wonderful. They were, uh, they, were, they were good people. Moving on, uh, we went, went to uh, took a bus. Everything was on a bus. Our bus driver was named Artie. He was a wonderful guy. And he took us to uh, downtown, the inner ring. Uh, Vienna is, is comprised of rings. The outer ring was the old fortifications, and then there's the second ring, and then the inner ring. When you get to the inner ring, you're in the old city. Elm Schultz had done, a, <coughs> pardon me, had done a concert there at the end of World War II. He was a member of the U.S. Army Band in Europe. And one of his purposes for the trip was to recreate his concert in the Rathaus Platz in, uh, uh, in the middle of, uh, of Vienna. And, and we did. And as we left uh, Vienna, well, my, my favorite thing in Vienna was touring the Schoenbrunn Palace where the Habsburg uh, kings lived. Oh my God, you can't believe how opulent people live. The one Five thousand to one percent of the people. Uh, it, it, I think the uh, Schönbrunn Palace was something like 180 rooms, and uh, it, was, it was it was amazing. So as we left Vienna, uh, we had to say goodbye to our our, uh, our bus driver and our our guide. Uh, it, Evelyn, Evelyn said, "Be sure you leave when when you leave the bus." Give, Give Eddie a clap. A clap. 
Well, you said you get your butt clapped. <laughs> So, uh, that, that, the tour was wonderful. We, we, we played various concerts. Uh, one of them we played in uh, Romania. We played in a, a little, little sidewalk cafe and it started to rain. And so the, uh, the wives and, and husbands and, and, and uh, <coughs> significant others, the band members, held umbrellas over our heads so the music wouldn't get wet. Uh, so, we also played a concert uh, under the streetlights. And thank, thank goodness we played the same music every time. We played the Star Spangled Banner, we played Fire the Stripes Forever, we played the German March, of All Comrades, and Old Camera, Old Comrades, uh, and a lot of American music, but they really don't dig that. It's not, it's not their music, but they were played. So uh, that, that was the end of that concert, and we uh, at that city, rather, and then we flew back to uh, New York. To New York, each each uh, each country we spent about six, seven days. It was enough to, to get a good feel for it. The second tour was, was uh, three uh, three years later, and we went to, as I mentioned, we went uh, first to Yugoslavia, and then uh, down to Greece. And Yugoslavia was, a, was an amalgamation of, of seven, seven nations under Marshal Peel. And uh, so we landed in Belgrade, which is, of course, now in, in, uh, in, not in Yugoslavia anymore. It's part of, part of uh, the country of uh, Belgrade. That, that would be... Uh, yeah, yeah, Serbia, of course. And after Serbia, we went to uh, Sarajevo, which is in Bosnia. And the, uh, the big attraction there was standing in the spot where our arch, arch, <laughs> Archduke uh, was uh, assassinated in 1914. So, and then from there, we went to uh, Dubrovnik on the Adriatic coast. Dubrovnik is a very old city, and the walled city is uh, what, it, what it is, it's, just, it's a wall around uh, maybe a oh, half a square mile. Uh, no street, just little paths, because it was, it was built you know, five, six hundred years ago. Uh, so that was, that was interesting. Yeah, one of the, one of the <laughs> interesting attractions of, of, uh, of that city was that it was, it was hot. So being hot, who wore just minimal clothes. But um, in, the, in those countries, when you go swimming, uh, that number is uh, the size of swimsuit you wear, or if you wear one at all, is, is, is optional. <laughs> that, was, that was kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna share any secrets here, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's the word always. Okay, um, then we went to Greece, and we, we landed in Thessaloniki, which is a large city at the extreme north end of Greece. We took a bus all the way down to Athens, very hot, and uh, we toured, toured Athens, walked up the hill of the Parthenon, saw the Greek Museum, uh, we enjoyed Greek, Greek music. The Greek people were very gracious for it. And, and that's, their history is, is part of our history, actually, because our, our language, our alphabet, alpha, beta, first two letters of Greek alphabet, and enjoyed that very much. And then took uh, a ride in, the, uh, in, a, you know, in a boat through the Greek islands. And during all this, I'm, I'm seeing where we're uh, are going, but we're, we're doing concerts about every other day, playing the same music. And uh, the, the uh, ambassador's band was there, and they, they did some concerts too. They, did, they were on television, in fact, in Romania and also in Greece. So that was the, the genesis of that tour. And um, so we went 
and we had to take a train ride. Uh, I'm sorry, we, we had to take a, a bus back to, the, to Thessaloniki and then take the train all the way back to Belgrade. The reason is we were flying on Yugoslav Airlines and so we had to fly both ways. We couldn't just come back to New York through Athens. We had to, we had to go all the way up through Greece and Macedonia. And go home. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> How are we doing on time? <laughs> time? Okay. The third tour, uh, <laughs> we can talk about that after we call it. Did you even mention the time when you got stuck in the elevator? Oh. Or the guy that drove up in his motor scooter and grabbed a baton out of Gene Wallman's hand? He was angry because they blocked off the street around the city park. So he got over in like jail. Im Himmel da gibt kein Bier, ja? Uh, I think they work for beer, don't you? Yeah, mostly. Yeah. Mostly. Yeah. No, we work better with beer. You work better with <laughs> beer. Okay, I'll buy into that. Our next speaker is Jermaine Galata. She uh, was a teacher for many years in high school, in the middle school, and in the grade schools. She started a program with the kids, and I guess you'll tell us a little bit about that, right? <coughs> Jack told me that after I'm done speaking, the band is going to play Beer Barrel Polka. So I'm not sure what that all means about me being surrounded by beer. <laughs> Nonetheless, I was asked to speak to you about connecting the generations. And there is a section in your booklet about that. And I was thinking about this as I was running through some notes. and. I thought, you know, it's really kind of an unspoken mission of the band to connect with the generations. Um, it's a natural, I think, um, um, happening with the group that that should happen because we're all passionate about music and we'd like to extend um, our support for any young students who are interested in music. So, anyway, um, the band started in 1966, and shortly after that, in 1969, and this is mentioned in your booklet, there was a group formed called the Generation Gap Band. Um, I wasn't in the band at that time, um, but I'm told that it was a number of um, members had children or grandchildren that were starting to play. So they thought, well, gee, that'd be kind of neat to, you know, join together and perform together. And so they did. And that was in 1969. Um, I joined the band in 1984. It was the same year I started teaching in the district. And I think it was in the late 1980s that um, I thought, you know, again, let's, let's connect. And so for a number of years, actually I think until I retired, um, we had many uh, of the band members who would come and play with my students on their spring concert, my sixth graders or my seventh graders. And always after they were done, and I think there were a number of people here who, who did play with them, um, always after the concert was done or the rehearsals were done leading up to it, kids would say, man, those old people can really play. <laughs> and, you know, I always told them, you know, it's a lifetime thing. And that was the one of the points of them seeing that, you know, to know that they can do that for a lifetime. It's football, you know, probably not going to be playing it when you're 80 years old. But an instrument, yeah, very possible. And then when I retired, the program didn't continue, and I was a little bit disappointed in that. And then I thought, well, you know, Maybe that's not such a bad thing because then I would be playing with them and then they might think, yeah, you know where I'm going with that. <laughs> then they would say, oh, well, that old lady, she can really play. <laughs> so I didn't have to deal with that. Um, let's see. Oh, in 1978, John Nicholas, whom you heard about before, he was a charter member. And um, Patty told me there's some pictures of them up there. Um, also some pictures of students and uh, the adults playing together. 
But when John Nicholas passed away, there was a scholarship founded in his memory, and that scholarship went to um, a graduating high school senior who would be majoring in music. And in 1980, I was looking at records today. Um, I, my records only go back as far as 1980. But at that time, the community band was also sponsoring an outstanding senior band member recognition. That was for the seniors of the high school band to vote on somebody they thought was deserving of that award. And our thought behind it was, we always appreciate the leaders in our band. Um, so it was an opportunity for the high school seniors to also be able to recognize um, a senior member. And at somewhere in that timeline, too, we also started the music camp, the summer music camp scholarships. Um, so going back to 1980, those three scholarships were given, or, or earlier. That's as far back as my records go. Um, I counted, I don't know, a few years back, that we had given over $10,000 in scholarship money for summer camps. By this point in time, I'm guessing it's somewhere around 14,000. Uh, so that's where all of our donations at our summer concerts, our um, winter and spring concert, all of those donations have gone to those scholarships. So much appreciated with any donations that we get. And, oh, and in 2016, uh, we start, well, I don't know that it started in 2016, but the first scholarship was given in memory of Brent Ruppert. Brent Ruppert was a trumpet player. He was a um, band president, I believe, at one time. Um, also very instrumental in organizing the trips that we took. Um, so that um, scholarship was for a high school senior who was going on to school majoring in music, not necessarily music education, um, but the focus being on trumpet. So we have um, issued that scholarship already also. And maybe just two years ago, the band started to oversee the Havila Babcock Scholarship. Um, and that was a family, Nina family, that came forward once after a concert. And they had this money that they wanted to do something with. And when they went to a concert, they thought, hey, you know, this is perfect. So we are overseeing that scholarship also, and that goes to music camps. Um, to private lessons and to something called smart music. It's an electronic um, or a music app that kids can play along with. So we have issued some of those scholarships also. Uh, let's see, donations we talked about. Oh, and also in your booklet, there, there are only two that we could fit into the booklet, but there are two testimonials um, by uh, people who have received those uh, scholarships and how much it has meant to them. One of them is now a professor of trumpet at UW Oshkosh. Uh, the other one is, I think is graduating this coming spring or maybe one year le left yet, um, Arizona State University. And um, she has also benefited from that. And whenever I see her, she mentions it too. She's been at our summer concerts again and as she comes home for the summer. So those scholarships are, you know, well worth any donation that you get, have given because the, it, it truly does mean a lot to those students. And also, connecting the generations, ah, timely. Um, we do a, uh, a children's concert every summer. That started with Kevin Peters, I think, in 2007. I think Doris had looked at that for us. And we're still continuing with that. And that's also a fun concert in connecting with our younger students. We have them come up on stage. Um, there's no picture of the strawberry lady in there. Um, the strawberry lady was Jean Trotter, and she would lead those young kids throughout the park whenever we played a, a march. And they'd just go marching along, following the strawberry lady. And um, Miller and Mike, you saw just a little while ago, uh, they are the um, clowns, and they do a fantastic job. So if you haven't been to that particular concert yet, you might want, want, want to mark your calendars on that one, because that's a lot of fun. And then I saw some other pictures up there with um, uh, the students get invited up on stage uh, when we play um, Instant Swing. 
instant concert, instant concert, and it's, um, I don't know, maybe 30 different little uh, snippets of folk tunes that most kids would recognize. There's a picture right there. And, and that's really cool because that gets the kids up on stage and they get to hear what it sounds like on stage, plus they get to get um, next to an instrument that they think they might want to play in the future. So that's also a lot of fun with our children's concert. And... I think I have. <laughs> oh yeah, and there's one where Marty too has been at, there we go, again very timely, where he asked the student, I don't know if it's pre-planned or not, no it's never been, okay, um, a student comes up and he act they actually get to direct the band too. So I don't have anything more right now, so I'll introduce Jack again or just Beer Barrel Polka, if anybody wants to get up and dance, by all means. A couple of the speakers have mentioned your booklet. Well, actually, two years ago, we had our 50th anniversary. We've got lots of those available. There are some out there on the table. There are some here uh, on, the, on that table. So help yourself. They're free. That's all you get. <laughs> OK, it's time now for a uh, gal who just retired as director of Nina's Rec Park and Rec, Eileen McCoy. Eileen, I hope you come up. So, um, so the question has to be asked, why Park and Recreation? Why is Park and Recreation having a band? Why does the city have a band? Well, the beginning of that answer is that the mission of the Parks and Recreation Department is creating community through people, parks, and programs. So that's everything that we do falls into that mission. Everything that we do, we're trying to create community. And we actually have nine areas that those of us in Parks and Recreation look at. That's uh, provide recreational experiences, foster human development, promote health and wellness. And as I'm saying these, you can kind of think of things like, oh yeah, you teach swim lessons that promotes health and wellness, fitness classes, facilitate community problem solving. That's a little goofy one, but it works. <laughs> um, protect environmental resources. Of course, we're Parks people. Strengthen safety and security. Strengthen community image and sense of place. I want you to think about that. Support economic development and increase cultural unity. So how does the band fit in? Band fits in actually a lot of those. Right off the bat, the members of the band, when, they, when you talked about Phil, the group that wanted to start the band in the very beginning, what were they after? They were musicians and they wanted to be able to enjoy being able to still play their musical instruments and the camaraderie of other musicians. So that's a recreational experience. And when the band was formed, I'm sure a lot of them were thinking, that's what I have in mind. I want to be able to do that. Okay, well then there's the audience. For those of us that my poor mother sent me to piano lessons for 12 years and I can barely play chopsticks, but I like, to, I like music. So I like to be able to go out and enjoy listening to the band. So for me, that's a recreational experience. But it's even more than that. Because when you think about a Tuesday night, when you're sitting in Riverside Park, and it's a, you know, it can be a pretty diverse crowd. You've got a family over here that's got a little picnic supper. Uh, you've got a group that comes and they have their wheelchairs up in front. And they might not be able to get up and walk around, but they're enjoying the music and enjoying the night out. Um, you'll often have people show up on bicycles that didn't even know there was a band concert, and they hear something going on, and they pull up, and they're listening. Um, you have your bench people, and you have your chair people. <laughs> <And they're> <laughs> if you're a bench person, you come for your green bench. If you're a chair person, you bring your chair. Um, I know this because when I would hand out programs, and often I would go to the, the back, you know, seeing people come in, and I'd get in there like, oh no, I'm back here in my chair. Oh, it's all right. So you've got the people in the back, and you have the people in the front. But you've got a, a pretty diverse group. But it's not unusual to be walking through Pick and Save the next day, and you see somebody, you don't know their name, but you recognize them, and oh yeah, and they're like, well, I had a good concert last night. Yeah, it was. We don't know each other, but we saw each other at the concert. That's creating community. That's, that's something that sometimes you don't plan for, but it happens. And that falls into the category of what's very important to the folks at Parks and Recreation. The audience 
is a big part of what we do. And one of my favorite pictures here is the one where the, the green benches are all empty because it's raining. Marty was conducting. There's a couple of people out there with umbrellas and Marty's like, it's gonna be raining, that storm's coming, folks, shall we wrap it up? No, the audience wasn't leaving. So the audience came right up on stage and got up with the band under the band shell. Again, there's a, there's a connection there that is provided. I think the band and the audience feel that sort of family connection that we have together. Um, there were a couple of other stories I wanted to tell you about. Um, oh, the, yeah, the children's concert, and um, Jermaine really hit on that. My favorite one is the kid plugging his ears, by the way. But um, that fits, again, well into part of our mission of, of creating community, fostering human development. What a great opportunity for kids to get exposed to music who might not otherwise get exposed to music, not just at the children's concert, but sitting in the audience on any of those given Tuesday nights. Um, I want to tell you a story about, oh, I, I, I should mention the German band and the ambassadors. Um, the, we actually have three bands. We have the main band, and then we have the German band and the ambassadors that are, that are, are two other bands within that band umbrella. And as was mentioned before, the, the German band does an awful lot of cool work out in the community. They're playing in nursing homes. They've played at, and the ambassadors, too, playing at, at a lot of our civic events, playing at the Main Street Bridge opening, um, playing at, uh, well, we threw a huge gala when marriage and retired after 16 years of, of being mayor, and the ambassadors played at that event. Um, we had the, we hosted with the city of Menasha the, the state park tour, summer park tour one summer, and, and it's a big deal to get it. You have to, you have to put your name in five years in advance, and, and we had gotten the, the bid to do it, and we were doing with that with Menasha, and the ambassadors played in Jefferson Park at the dinner that we had. You guys, any of you guys that played remember this? And it was, there, there was a, a fellow there, because we also draw people from Illinois into our conferences, from Wisconsin Parks and Recreation. There was a fellow there from Naperville. And I'll never forget this, because at one of the clinics, they were talking about how in Naperville they have park districts. Very fancy. <laughs> and they actually are their own taxing entity. And they're very proud of this, and this is a very big deal, and la la, you're going to have a park district. And that was very nice. And this guy came up to me that night, and he's like, where'd you get that band? And I go, oh, the ambassadors, well, that's their, you know, they're ours. He goes, what do you mean they're yours? And I said, well, it's a park and recreation program. They're, they're ours. And he goes, that's your band? And I said, well, that's one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm kind of back to... So why does the city sponsor the band? The city, the city is a cooperative, right? And so we have to, we all pool our resources and, and we have to decide how we're gonna do things with those resources to make our lives better. And when you're on the team that is part of the group that does that, you have to make some hard decisions sometimes. And it always comes down to what's a nice to have and what's a need to have. And I, I'm going to guess, just looking out here, most of you that have been to band concerts, you know the feeling of being at a band concert. Being there on a Tuesday night, watching people, communicating with other folks, waving to people that you don't know, but you've got that connection there, you're having a good time. I want you to think about how you feel when you get up and you walk out in the morning. I'm guessing most of us don't go out and look at our street and go, that asphalt makes me so fulfilled. <laughs> That's a great street. <laughs> now, I'm not disrespecting my brothers and sisters in public works. That's a necessity, too. But if I'm going to choose where I'm going to live and choose where my home is going to be for less than $7,000 a year, I want this in my life. So, thank you very much. some of the energy and some of the heart this gal gave for so many years. Thank you, Eileen, for miss you. Miss you a lot. I have one other thing to show you, and that is there are on that table, again, these little yellow, little yellow sheets. They have the band concert schedule 
the summer and into the fall and through August 21st. Let's go into that. We all have so much to say. Whether you care or not about it, it's, it's kind of your stock, you know. <laughs> but a lot of people that played in the band when it started were veterans, Second World War veterans, and uh, it, uh, so we want to be patriotic. And I think Marty's going to talk about that, and he's going to give a little insight into our future. Marty? Thank you. Uh, give another uh, round of applause for Jack. He's been a long time supporter. Uh, you Without know, the assistance of Jack and many other people, there's a lot of things that this band could not have done. Um, when, when I was approached by this committee putting this together, they asked me to put together a couple of things, one of which was patriotism. And I thought to myself, well, you know, why me? I, I, didn't, I didn't know why me. And uh, hearing more of the history of the band uh, it made a little bit more sense. I, I'm not from a military family. Uh, my parents weren't veterans. Um, I don't have any direct connection to military as, as far as I know, other than my grandfather flying uh, bombers over Germany in World War II. Um, so I don't have a veteran's perspective. Um, and I got to think a little bit, my patriotism, the love that I have for this country has developed other ways, and that ties into where we go with the band here. Um, you know, when I was a kid, uh, most of my vacations were out east. Uh, I can trace my roots back to the um, second wave of the Mayflower um, and uh, the Revolutionary War, and so I lived uh, our American history. I saw Bunker Hill. I lived Paul Revere's ride. I uh, saw Fort Ticonderoga. I I knew of the story of the Green and uh, the Green Mountain Boys. Um, that's what why that's what I lived. And so I developed that kind of that love for country in our early days, uh, unknowingly kind of developing my early patriotism. Um, like many of us who were in bands in high school, I participated in the Memorial Day activities, much of which were very, um, very powerful events, uh, very solemn events. Uh, I did several uh, ceremonies in addition to parades when I was in high school. My band director instilled that upon us as very, very important things uh, that we do towards the community. And so unknowingly, I kind of was, again, kind of developing this whole thing and developing my, my little patriotism. It swung full circle when I became a high school band director myself. I taught high school for a few years before I do what I do now. And I did several uh, ceremonies and several parades on Memorial Day. And this was something that had been done for decades before me, and I was assuming a role that, that was already well established. But when I saw from that, a little bit older than myself perspective, the impact and the power of those who it meant the most to, that changed me a little bit. And it changed me in the sense that I didn't understand what the veterans had gone through. I, I never will. But I know that it was very powerful for them and that it's really important for me to educate that next generation of those who don't. And I view the role of the band as part of that and developing that patriotism. The, if nothing else, my students, other than getting really good music education, they would learn that they may not understand what goes on with our veterans and what our country and those who, things that are bigger than us, but it's really important to somebody. And we have to develop that understanding if we can, and if we can't, we need to know that we don't. Um, that patriotism, that love, that loyalty, that pride of our country uh, takes time. And some people have a very, it's a very powerful emotion for them. So when I joined the band uh, back in 2010, 20, 2010, I think it was 2010, that following summer, um, uh, I didn't know of any of the, the prior engagements that the band had done. I, I was unaware of the obligations, other than we did a winter concert and a spring concert, and we did a few things in the summer, including going to King. Uh, and so I was approached almost immediately by uh, the VFW to participate in the Armed Forces Day uh, ceremony. And that, at the time, was at the Green Lawn uh, Cemetery off of uh, the frontage road there, right, right off by Breezewood. And uh, so I was like, yeah, sure, we can do that not knowing that there was no history with that whatsoever. Since then, we've now moved 
to the Isle of Valor, which we've been with now. This is going to be our, I think, our eighth year doing something like this. And we've seen that, that grow. Uh, it's such a beautiful site. It got this historic recognition just a couple of years ago. We've been part of the rededication for some of the monuments uh, and, and been part of that process and been very integrated with some of the, the veterans' organizations. Um, I view things like that as really important to giving back to our community and our civic duty as bands to promote that patriotism. We were involved with the 9-11 ceremony that, that they did, the remembrance ceremony back at Nina High School, for those of you who were there. We were involved with that. We've been involved with other um, uh, veterans things. When the Shattuck Park had their little, their little uh, the rededication for the, 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 the monuments there. Uh, we've been very involved with all that stuff. We were involved with the Old Glory flight uh, just about a year or so ago. Um, those are really powerful events. And it's not that patriotism and military has anything that they don't have to necessarily be together, but they do work really well together, right? They do work really, really well together. Um, and I view the role that our band has is promoting that patriotism. Yes, sometimes it does work with the military, sometimes it doesn't. But the, when we play American songs and those patriotic tunes, I think of the shared values that we have, the common ideals that we have, that all of us have for this nation, this country is a, a larger than ourselves. Uh, and I think that when we play that music, we're educating that next generation and reminding us, reminding us of those ideal, ideals and those values. Um, one of my favorite events that we do every year that works for the patriotism and for the veterans. Um, when I was when I was a kid, I was just still a stroller. My uh, my Fourth of July uh, always consisted at the Blossom Music Festival outside Cleveland, Ohio. Ever since I was a stroller, I would go, and at the very end, there was 1812 overture. And at the very end, we had a special guest, and there were these large cannons, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and there are thousands, there's like probably 10, maybe 20,000 people. And these large cannons would be off to the side, and uh, at the very end, they would, uh, they would start, they would blast, right? And they, they would, he was very loud. I remember as a child being very, very uh, surprised sometimes. Maybe I was sleeping. Uh, and then the fireworks would, would go right after that. So I approached Eileen at the time, uh, and I said, I've got this idea. And I think she scratched her head a few times. And, and thought a little bit, this is a little, little crazy. Uh, this guy wants to like, you know, shoot up cannons at Riverside Park on 4th of July. We've got thousands of people around. Um, and uh, we, we worked a little bit together. We found some people. She was able to contact, uh, the, 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 at the time it was the, the American Legion. They still do it, the, the uh, honor guard from the American Legion. And um, those guys, they, uh, there's, a, there's a picture of them somewhere in there, but um, they, uh, they line up, there's about eight of them, and they've got their, uh, they do their honor cer ceremonial salutes and, uh, during, the, during the performance. And many of those of you who've been there, uh, it's a really powerful event. And uh, I think those types of events are things that instill all of those ideals, those values, those common shared interests that we have that, again, we're passing on to the next generation. So. So that's kind of like, that's where I kind of see where the band fits in the Patriots. It's, it's such an important part of our, our heritage and what we do here. Um, before I transition to the, f the future of the band, uh, I wanted to comment on Eileen's uh, story earlier that she made about <clears throat> the, uh, there's, a, there's a picture with all, there's like nobody outside, there's everybody's like out the side, because it was pouring. I mean, it was, it was, it was really raining. Uh, the weatherman said it was gonna just blow over. And I was talking to Eileen earlier that day. This is still my favorite concert to this day. We've, I've, I've done a few concert with, concerts with the band to this point, but this is, the, this is probably still the favorite concert. Um, the weather man said it was going to blow over. Eileen and I had everything set up. We're like, okay, maybe it might rain a little bit, but we're, gonna just, we're just going to go with this. And I said, yeah, we're going to do this. And we're going to, it started raining a little bit. We, uh, we, we went out to the audience. We're like, well, it's going to rain. Do you want to do, do keep going? Oh, no, yeah, keep going, keep going. It's, it's raining really, really hard. Right? Yeah, keep going. It poured the entire concert. It, I mean, it rained cats and dogs. It was so heavy. I mean, there were people who were in huddled huddle up in the umbrellas and like tarps, and they were just hanging out. And that was my favorite concert. Um, not only did I have like it was one of my favorite like programs. It was the history of the American March, ironically enough, of patriotism, and it had all this going. It had all these great notes and these great and, and none of it mattered. And none of it mattered. We played marches, and I know the horn French horn players counted the offbeats. But it, it didn't matter because the thing that was most amazing about that concert was that everybody did come up on stage. And I got more positive comments about that because the band was like, we were all just one thing. People were like, oh, I can see like what's going on in the music. And it was like, cool, I've never been on stage. I've never played in a band before. In fact, I felt like I was part of the band, um, which precipitated several years of ideas of planning to what we do. We did, this past year, we did this concert in around at Shattuck Park where the 
the audience can kind of envelop, envelop the band. And we'll be doing that again this year. Uh, our children's concert will be held at uh, Shattuck Park uh, this, this July, right after our 4th of July performance. Again, to kind of promote that same thing, kind of enveloping the band, it's a different perspective, it's going to sound a little different, and the kids can kind of run around and kind of see that whole thing, so it's kind of cool. Um, the future of the band. A little bit about the future of the band. I, I believe that the future of the band is um, continuing what we've done. I view the, band, the community band, this band specifically, as two really main important things. First, it's a social event, right? We're community. The second thing is we're gonna to play to the best of our ability, whatever that is. Whatever the best of our ability, we're always gonna to play to the best of our ability. But first and foremost, it has to be community. Whatever that means, social, emotional, it's a break from the nine to five. Uh, it's their one day off a week. Some people doing it for over 50 years. The community part is so important. And then the band part, we're gonna play really well. We're gonna play great music, we're gonna play at a really high level, and we're gonna have a good time doing it. And that's what the community band will. And I believe that Nita Community Band is one of those true, good, great examples of what a community band actually embodies anywhere around. Anybody who's been a concert knows what I'm talking about. It shows the best of both of those worlds. And the future of this band is really, the foundation is the community, the city, the the going to the performances, the support that even non-band members can bring to this band, that type of support will drive the future of this community band, which again, I really believe is one of the best community bands and embody what a community band should be, to rest on the shoulders of the people that support it. So the future of the band, I do believe, is on good shoulders. The band is bigger than ever. It's the biggest the band has ever been. And the concerts are more well attended than they've ever been. And I believe that that's going to continue to be the future of the community. Thank you. Well, the hour grows late, but we got music. This is called the Village Tavern Polka. I want to also acknowledge Amanda Ar Armitage for the pictures. She put the show together, so that's nice. Thank you. One thing we can always say for all three of the bands, they play well together. <laughs> Come over here, will you, Jane? I have to give you the microphone, don't I? <laughs> Actually, what I want to do is give you one of our band uh, sure. shirts. Uh, we had them made it, I guess, why did we make those? During the 50th or the 50th? And that's yours. Thank you so much for inviting us. Thank you all for coming. We appreciate it. Such a great hometown.